it'll be just a regular kind of uh, summary of what we did before and what we have in the pipeline coming up and uh, yeah please ask a lot of questions uh, about the new features and uh, mention mention new features that you'd like us to do right i'll leave it to xian xian go ahead please all right all right, cool. All right, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to our first user meeting in 2024. Uh, and my name is Xiang, and I'm one of the engineers here at Kuzu. Many of you probably have already met me before, since I also hosted several user meetings in the 2023. So glad to see everyone here. Um, so the same as before, we will start with an overview of what we have done since the previous user meeting, and that includes a native RDF support, uh, an extension framework together with our first official extension over remote file systems, and some new Cypher features and some performance related Im improvement uh, that happens in the system internal. So before we start on RDF, let me quickly remind you the vision of Kuzu. Kuzu's vision is basically to be the go-to system for graph workload. So we want to consume data in different input formats. Uh, it could be either Parquet CSV or even data sitting in other database systems. And for the downstream tasks, instead of, instead of implementing those uh, features by ourselves internally, we instead want to provide a nice interface to move data seamlessly between Kuzu and those external uh, libraries. So with RDF feature, we actually take one more step towards uh, this video. So let's start with data model. Uh, when it comes to the question of what are the most popular graph models, probably graph model must be one of it. And this is also Kuzu's data model. In a property graph model, data is represented as nodes and relationships. Each node uh, and relationship can have arbitrary number of key value property pairs. So for example, here, this person node has property key value pair name drawn and age 27. And nodes and relationships are, can also be associated with labels. So in this graph, we have two nodes that are labeled as person and one node labeled as book. And property graph model is quite close to relational, relational model in the sense that nodes and the relationships can also be mapped as node tables and relationship tables. And another popular graph model is the RDF model, which stands for the resource description framework. RDF is a graph-based model where data is rep represented in subject, predicate, object, triple format. So in this example, if you look at the second block of RDF data here, it actually contains four triples, Adam, a student, Adam lives in Waterloo, Adam named Adam, and Adam age 30. So the basic elements of data in RDF are resources, and these resources are identified by unique IRIs. IRIs are, is a very similar concept to, uh, to, to URL. So Taking this KZ Waterloo as example, this KZ Waterloo is a resource where KZ is just a short form abbreviation of the base URL. So if we expand the KZ as a prefix, the resource KZ Waterloo is, can be identified by this URL HTTP kuzu.io uh, RDF example Waterloo. And according to RDF standard, subject and predicates must be resources, and object can either be a resource or a literal. So if you look at the second triple, if, if you look at the second triple here, uh, Waterloo name Waterloo, the object is a stream value that doesn't refers to any of the IRIs. So instead of being a resource, this object is actually a string literal. And the at en is just an optional language tag. That is, that is used to specify the language of this string literal. And RDF model is quite flexible and suitable for modeling heterogeneous data. So in practice, many knowledge graphs are actually modeled in RDF. So the goal, the goal of Kuzu's native RDF support uh, is basically to get cipher over your RDF data. And in the meanwhile, you will also benefit from Kuzu's fast uh, querying process query processing capabilities. 
So on the data loading side, we allow direct ingestion of RDF data and automatically convert it into uh, our property graph model internally. And on the querying side, we allow query RDF data with cipher statement. And more importantly, we support queries that combines RDF data and property graph data together. So let me walk you through uh, our RDF support with an example. The first step is to create a schema for your RDF graph through this create RDF graph statement. So in this case, we create an RDF graph called UniKG, which is a short name for university knowledge graph. And internally, we will model it into four tables, including two node tables, one for the resource and the other for literal. And apart from their ID column, resource table has this IRI column storing the stream-based IRIs. And literal table has a wall column storing typed literals and a long column storing the optional language tag. And then we have two relationship tables. One connects from resource to resource and the other connects from resource to literal. So we have these two relationship tables because we define uh, from to over subject and object and record that according to RDF standard, object can, object can either be a resource or literal. So we end up with uh, two relationship tables here. And both of these two relationship table has a column storing the predicate IRI as a property. And in, in one way to understand this create RDF graph is that an RDF graph defines a mapping uh, from your RDF data into property graph model. So the next step is to then ingest RDF data into these tables. Uh, at a high level, you can imagine the process as we write into these internal tables one by one. So we first iterate over each tables in this file. For each of the resource node, we append into resource table. For each of the literal, we append into literal table. And then we iterate the triples again. For each of the triple, we convert subject and object into their IDs respectively. Uh, and for the predicate, we directly store it as a, uh, into the IRI column as a relationship property. So taking the first triple as an example, the first triple is Waterloo A city. Waterloo maps to ID zero, according to our uh, resource table, unikg underscore R, and city maps to ID two. So we insert this triple into resource to resource table as zero RDF type two. RDF type is just a uh, the expanded form of uh, predicate A. And similarly for the second triple Waterloo name Waterloo, uh, the resource Waterloo maps back to the ID zero in unikg underscore R resource table. The literal Waterloo also maps back to index zero. Uh, from the literal table under unikg underscore L. So we insert it as a zero name zero into the resource to literal table here. So we provide two options for data ingestion. The first option, the first one is the out of memory mode. So by default, we use in memory mode, which should be a lot faster, but also quite memory intensive because it requires to catch all the triples in the memory first. So if your data is larger than memory, you can try our, you can just try our out of memory mode by setting the in-memory option to false. And we also provide a strict mode. Uh, by default, Kuzu always perform this best, best effort parsing, meaning we, we, we will skip more from triples if we cannot parse it. So if you instead would like to interrupt the process or throw a runtime exception on more from lines, you can simply set the strict option to true. So next comes to the query part. Uh, so since we model RDF data as property graph model internally, you can query them as if they are regular property graph tables. So here in this example, we simply query the resource table by listing five resources from unikg underscore R. And similarly, we can also list all the resource to resource all the resource to resource triples through a simple match pattern that goes go from unikg underscore r to another unikg underscore r. So one thing you might ask is how can we query resource and literals together? 
And it, this is, for example, how do we list all the triples in the database? So if you come from Sparkle world, this is like the most fundamental thing everyone would try uh, with a new database. And it turns out this can also be done relatively easy with multi-label querying in, in Cypher. So you can choose to either specify both of the resource to resource table and resource to literal table. So the union of unikj underscore RT and unikj underscore LT together, or you can just use unikg, the RDF graph name as a syntactic sugar to represent the union of both relationship tables. Uh, our database will automatically infer uh, which tables you are trying to match. So in this case, you just need to simply write SPO and providing UniKG as a label for your uh, query hash. And then that should list all the triples existing in the database. So next, let's move to a more complex setup where we have both RDF data and property graph data. So here on top of our existing RDF data, we add two more property graph nodes, Adam and Carissa, and we assume the they are modeled uh, in a node table called student table so that uh, we can use it in the, in the query, in the Cypher query later on. So one thing to observe here is that Adam and Carissa, they both appear in RDF data and property graph data. So what we are interested in is to somehow combining all the information from two data, two data sets um, about these two person. One way to combine the information is through is to match data from both sides and then join them together. So in the query here, I first match, we can first match all the tuples in the property graph model. So from the student table, and then match all the triples in the RDF graph. And then we can apply a join condition between the IRI property from your RDF data and the name property uh, from the student table through this bare predicate. And finally, we return all the triples, their IRIs uh, and values, and also the form property associated in, uh, with the student table. So the result here shows we are, with this query, we are actually able to query all the triple, triples and also combine the information with the form property from our property graph table. And instead of using join to combine this data, there's another way uh, we could we, we could actually take one step further and create edges between RDF resources and property graph nodes. So ideally, what we want is to somehow link this resource KZ Adam with this node Adam from the property graph data, and similarly, we want to link this resource Carissa with this node Carissa. And it turns out this is also quite straightforward if you were to do it in Kuzu. So first, we need to define a relationship table called same student that goes from a our resource table, unikg underscore r, to our property graph node table, so to the student table. And then we select the pair of resource nodes and student node um, whose IRI property equals to the name property. Uh, to be more specific, equals to the concatenation uh, of this common prefix plus the name property. So once we figure out this node pairs, we can then create an edge between each of uh, these node pairs over the same student query edge. So after that, we are able to query between RDF resource node and property graph node through a regular uh, match pattern directly. So for example, here, the first part from A to S, we are querying all the students with name Adam and their corresponding resource node. And then we further go out from S to query all the triples uh, that are associated with the resource node around Adam, uh, around Adam. So, and if you look at the result, we end up with all the triples related to Adam and the phone number of Adam as well. So this is another approach uh, where we can combine RDF data with property graph data. So, so far we have covered and let me interrupt. So Tom had a question now that you've covered up the query. Um, mm -hmm. So before I ask maybe Tom's question uh, on chat, mm -hmm. uh, this one has basically emphasized that 
this feature of RDF graphs, uh, basically to, to use it properly, the mapping of RDF triples into those four tables is the critical part. Because once you kind of understand what the mapping is, then the rest of the querying is just in Cypher because everything is now property graph model. Everything is node tables or rel tables. So everything is understood and interpreted. All queries are understood and interpreted and they compile in the property graph world. Right? So that's why the way we kind of also documented uh, in the documentation, the how the description of this feature is that it's essentially a, a specific mapping of that we chose like you could have probably there's probably different ways to map triples into a property graph but this is a specific mapping that we chose and this is the automatic automatic mapping that we do once you create an rdf graph and copy turtle files into mm -hmm. it right um mm -hmm. so anyway so that's one thing that i want to comment i want to make so one question, there might be other questions. But yeah, we'll... another one maybe from my, uh, we, we worked on a old to LPG uh, lossless conversion some years back with Mark Muse's team in, uh, in Stanford, yeah, the web protocol people. And what we saw there, of course, uh, was um, somewhat like a factor of 10 in the size of the graphs. Yeah? If you do a, um, let's say a compact uh, LPG representation, or in uh, RDF graph, for example, yeah? especially when you have uh, a lot of um, edge properties uh, that you would have to model as dedicated nodes and so on and so forth. Yeah? So there was some, at least a, a factor of 10 in the size of the resulting graph structures in that way. Um, are you thinking about which some one, kind of was, complexification? So which one was larger? Uh, the RDF uh, representations so or the old, basically that was, uh, uh, a full old specification, yeah, that we used there. Uh, but uh, let's say having the RDF model was about 10 times uh, larger uh, in uh, the number of nodes edges uh, compared to a compact uh, LPG model containing exactly the same information. Um, so, um, so, so what, what is exactly the, are you, were you asking a question? I think you were asking. Yeah, the, the question is, I mean, if uh, let's say from, a uh, more optimized uh, storage for the, I mean, as you, you probably will not offer Spartle, right, in that way to, to query the, uh, the structures, but um, in the way the, um, let's say, optimizing the RDF structure in using, for example, the, the edge properties and so on, uh, or let's say offering a more compact, even maybe virtual representation of the RDF graph in, in fully leveraging the capabilities of, the, uh, of LPG. If you're thinking about something like that. So uh, we don't currently have, so we've got, so Xian, can you go to the four table slide? Mm -hmm. okay. So this is how we map, this, this is exactly our mapping. The, the mm -hmm. Triples get mapped into two node tables and two rel tables. Mm -hmm. uh, resources get into one node table, the literals get into another node table. Mm -hmm. And you got the resource, the resource triples, which is mm -hmm. a relationship table, and resource, the literals relationship table. Uh, this is this is it. Uh, we this is like this is what we fixed at least in this in this. Mm -hmm. um, we don't plan to change this right now. So right now there are restrictions, for example, that you can't change these tables, but you can essentially create other tables that link to these tables. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a choice that that we made that it mm -hmm. would allow you to, for example, add more data into your uh, extend your triples uh, for mm -hmm. additional data. So, for example, this example that Xiang showed is that suppose you had another database of students, which wasn't in triples, but it was a regular node mm -hmm. table, but students had names and they matched uh, maybe the um, parts of the IRIs of the resources, and that mm. was the way you could link them. Then you could ask queries to extend those resources with mm -hmm. the, this new student table. So you can do things like that. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if that answers the question, but we have kind of fixed this mapping for now so that there is a mapping you get and you can query your triples with Cypher. 
Mm -hmm. And then, then you can use all our existing uh, property graph uh, sort of features, which is you can have a node table, you can have a rel table, you can connect it with these nodes and rel tables, just like you create a property graph database. You can mm -hmm. do all that. Now that everything is mapped to a node and rel table, all the triples are also mapped into a node and rel table. Well, it makes sense. And I mean, as you also mentioned, the opportunity to link uh, nodes in the LPG model with, uh, for example, the ontology representation in RDF. I mean, you have your, your schema, yeah, like your entity schema in, in RDF and link the uh, related entities in LPG or so, so the things that we did there. Uh, the rest might be something that we could discuss at some point about uh, maybe something like views on top of the uh, RDF scheme that uh, give you a more condensed view uh, in LPG, also for improved uh, Spark, uh, for improved uh, cipher querying of the data, but that's we could do that offline if you. Yeah, we can we can discuss this one. So uh, another thing that I want to say is that we don't have a, like we don't we don't compact the data compared to the turtle file sizes. I think mm -hmm. much once you map it, uh, we can like, we can I can look at some some data to tell you, but I don't think it it's like ten x more compact than the turtle mm. file size. Like once mm. you map this turtle file into a Kuzu database, I don't think you get something 10x more com compact. Mm. Uh, yeah. One reason is that relationship tables are essentially indexed twice or backward and forward. So we get this kind of um, uh, blow up a little bit there. Uh, although we do, uh, we are going to compress the IRIs and whatnot. Uh, so some, so the, our space will get, uh, more compact, but uh, I don't expect a 10x uh, compact compactness at, uh, mm -hmm. for single CPU. I don't even I don't even know if there's room for that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Tom's now. Let me now ask Tom's question. Tom, I just wanted to hear about the, how do you load data that's larger than memory. So, can you say a bit more about that, Jack? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, so the in-memory one will be. Uh, pull all the data into the memory and then uh, scans from there. The out of memory one will be, I load a chunk of the RDF. So, uh, so suppose you have 10 million rows. I might choose to load bulk loading 496 rows at a time into the, into, into the memory and then perform ingestion. Once I consume all the, uh, once I consume this block, 4,096 uh, rows. I will consume the next 4,096 rows. Um, the problem with this setup is I have to repeatedly pull data into memory and then spill up, spill it out from the memory. So that's why the out of memory version will be a lot slower. But the memory consumption will be uh, consistently bound by the size of your block, so the size of 4,096 uh, triples. Yeah. Is the um, larger than memories, um, is that restricted to just this data loading for the RDF stuff? Um, is this like a more widely, okay. So it's not, Kuzu entirely is now supporting larger than memory graphs. Um, Kuzu has, has like a... so Kuzu by default supports larger than memory graphs, so always. Oh, okay. But okay. this is just so let me just be very clear. So this is just a faster way of loading data, turtle files, just uh, turtle files, not okay. in gen not not in general like CSV and Parquet files into regular node tables. This is if you're loading turtle files and you know using our RDF graphs feature, um, by default there is a slower way and safer way to load. And then there's a faster way, which is actually Xi'an caches the file in memory. So it takes more space, but then you're gonna get, think of it like 1.5 to 2X speed up. Like maybe think, think of the 1.5 as a, as a ballpark number, how, how much faster you're gonna get. So if you're taking six minutes, it's gonna go down to maybe four minutes. Think of it that way, roughly, okay? So I, I'll change from data set to data set, but he's got a way of caching the file so that when we're skinny, uh, scanning it, which we have to scan multiple times during loading, uh, 
uh, will the second and third and fourth scans, whatever, however many times we scan, will get faster during loaded. So this is just the loading feature. But uh, your, uh, in general, your um, once you create created your database, for example, a database file of say three hundred gigabytes, you can run it on a machine with thirty two gigabytes, and it will work fine. Right. So you you should always assume that we, you know, you can manage data sets that are much larger than your RAM size. Yeah. So this is just an optimization during loading of turtle files, not even CSV or parquet files. Thanks, that's super helpful. Okay. So any other questions? All right, uh, maybe let's continue. Yeah, so, I was so 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 apart from the querying of RDF data, um, we can move move forward and look at the how do we update RDF data. So in short, we, we support update uh, through standard software update statement, with two exceptions. So one thing is we the set statement is disabled for RDF data. So instead of trying to change your IRI, we recommend you to delete. Uh, the outdated triple and reinsert the new one. So th this style should also be more consistent with Sparkle because Sparkle also perform update in, in this fashion. Um, so set is disabled for RDF. And another thing that is disabled is we prevent deletion over resource node because it's it's tricky to track if a, resor a resource node is referenced by any of the triples or not. So enable this feature will have a performance yeah, implication. Predicates. You mean predicates? The predicates of the triples For... might be referencing a resource node. Uh, correct, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's for the update, update side. Other than that, you can just use the standard Cypher update and it should work fine. Um, and some other minor details related to RDF is um, for black nodes, we automatically infer black nodes during bulk loading and we store it in the form of this underscore colon IBG. The underscore colon is the standard prefix for, for black nodes according to RDF standard. And I stands for the file index. So in case you are bulk loading from multiple RDF files, we use I to differentiate black nodes across these different files. And J is just the index used to differentiate black nodes within the same file. So that's how we differentiate blank nodes. Um, for RDF literals, uh, internally we store it as a typed literal, meaning we store we store one byte for, for the type and the remaining bytes are the binary format of your literal that is stored as a blob. So during query evaluation, we'll do a best effort implicit casting uh, based on the expression you are trying to evaluate. So for example, if you are trying to evaluate value plus one, we will try to cast it uh, as an integer value implicitly and then perform the addition. In some case, you might want a different type other than the type you get from implicit casting. So in those cases, you can always overwrite with an explicit casting. So here you can just cast the value into a double and then perform uh, the addition afterwards. So that's pretty, uh, okay. So as, together with this RDF, RDF feature, we have also published uh, some of our preloaded, uh, we think that are popular RDF data set on our website where you can just download and play with. So that's pretty much uh, is our RDF feature. And the next feature, the next major feature we have done uh, for, for this release is the extension framework. And the, the point of extension is to add new features into Kuzu without actually modifying its resource code, without actually modifying its source code. So we end up with a smaller binary size and also fewer dependencies if you don't uh, need certain extensions. And the usage of the an extension can be set up with two steps. The first step is to install extension, which pulls the extension binary from our server into your local directory. And then load extension, which will register the extension into the uh, core binary. 
So together with this extension framework, we also release our first uh, official extension called HTTPFS. This extension allows you to read from a remote file system. So to use H HTTPFS extension, the first you need to install it. So simply call install HTTPFS and then register it into the database by load through this statement, load extension HTTPFS. So after that, uh, you can directly scan a file that is hosted remotely without putting it into your local machine. So in this example, we can scan this remote ct.csv and then return all the rows from it. Uh, HTTPFS extension can also be used to read and write files that are hosted on S3 bucket. So for example, we can again scan this parquet file on S3 bucket in a similar fashion as our previous example. And we can also copy, directly copy uh, multiple S3 files, uh, multiple files from S3 bucket uh, using a belt card uh, pattern matching. And you can also choose to write back, uh, write data back into S3 directly. So here we use this copy to statement, write back a parquet file back to your S3 storage directly. And because we implement our S3 read and write through S3 APIs, so we also need to expose several S3 configurations here. And these configurations can be changed in the same way as a as if they are a regular database configuration, meaning you can just use a call statement to, to, to set the value for this uh, S3 configurations. So that's for the S3 extension. So next, let me introduce some of the changes we made on the Cypher side. First, we have added UUID data type and also related functions, which you can find the documentation, which you can find the details on our website. So much thanks for jamming for this uh, new feature. And next, we are now able to capture Pandas data frame object uh, so that you can directly use it as a variable in a Cypher statement. So in this, in this example, you can directly load from a variable PD, which is a variable name for a Pandas data frame object, and then return all the columns from it. And just to remind and, you, load from essentially just takes each row and binds it to variables, right, uh, Xiang? It doesn't load it into the database. It essentially scans. No, it doesn't load into that. It purely scan the, the, scans the data pattern. frame. So you can use it yes. in the rest of the Cypher statement. So you can read each line of a Panda data frame and then cre write a create statement, which will now insert into Quizzo, for example. Or you could just scan the Pandas data frame and do an aggregation in the return statement and, and whatnot. It, it's not like copy from. It's, yes. Um, load mm -hmm. from. Although, can you do copy yes. from? Pandas data frame directly? Uh, not yet, right? Not in the pre yeah, it's not available in the, the current release. Now, the you'll be able to directly copy from a Pandas data frame into the database. So use it in the copy from statement as well soon. Uh, not, not in this release though. Yeah. Um, you, you can also embed the load from within the copy from, right? Like essentially scan and then like have a sub query within the copy from. I've done that and it seemed to work for me. Not yet, I think. That one too. Okay. Yeah. That's also not part of the... Okay, sorry, that's for CSV. Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, Xiang is actually on the copy from somebody He's actively working on that, uh, but uh, not uh, not in this release, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, so at last, we have uh, added a default search path uh, as a database configuration. So once you set a default search path, you can start using a relative path in all of your separate statements. So other than the separate changes, we have also made several improvements uh, at the core. So first we have implemented the constant compression, which means if we detect any of the chunk of your column data is a constant value, we will only materialize it once instead of duplicating this constant value for every for, for all for each rows. And on the testing side, we have Maxwell and Man migrating test cases from different places. Uh, in particular, they are they migrated SQLite logical tests and LDBC benchmark already. 
Um, and on the CLA side, CLI side, Matthias has improved our shell from multiple perspectives, including highlighting shortcuts, response speed, and so and many other, and many others. So much thanks to our interns for 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 this release. And one last important change that we have made on the performance side is our hash index. So we have moved from a single thread hash index implementation to a parallel hash index design. So here we just demonstrate an end-to-end -end bulk loading performance when we try to ingest a table with 220 million rows. The performance improvement is, is quite noticeable uh, he, as shown here as the number of threads increases. So we get 33% uh, improvement with eight threads parallelization. So that's pretty much what we have done in the past two and a half months, two or two and a half. Uh, uh, so next, let me give you a preview of what we are currently working on. So one of the major feature uh, in the coming release will be about Postgres extension. And I think there is a very high chance we will do it for Postgres, SQLite, and DuckDB all together. So this extension will allow us to direct scan a Postgres table, just like what we did for Pandas data frame. So you can use the Postgres table as a cipher variable. And with this extension, you will be able to move data from Postgres to Kudu seamlessly. And another feature that we are working on is copy into non-empty tables. So currently Kudu, Kudu only supports bulk loads into an empty table. And this was due to uh, some technical constraint we had back in the day. And now we are actively uh, working on it to remove this constraint. Hopefully we'll get it done very soon. And next we have import export database. And because Kuzu is under active development from time to time, we have to bump up our storage version without backward compatibility. So this feature should help when you try to migrate a Kuzu database from one version into a higher version. And, ooh. and on the WebAssembly side, we have decided to, we have made some progress, but end up deciding to put it on hold for the coming release. That's because um, there are some prerequisites needs to be done first. In, part in particular, we need to modify our buffer manager to make it work better in a 32-bit environment because WebAssembly is a 32-bit environment. So this WebAssembly feature will most likely not appear in the, in, the, in the coming release. And on the transaction side, we are moving towards MVCC, so multi-version concurrency control. So once that is done, you can expect a big improvement uh, over the entire update performance. And finally, for recursive joins, we have received user requests regarding providing different path semantics, so in particular, trial and acyclic semantic. Trial semantic meaning no edge can be repeated along the, along the path, and acyclic meaning no nodes can be repeated along the path. So we have put this into our roadmap as well. And also for the computation wise, we have move, we are planning to move towards a parallelized uh, recursive join implementation. And that should be the end of on my, that should be the end on my side. Uh, any questions, uh, suggestions, feature requests are all welcome. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Jiang. I will uh, just make a, a couple comments. So one thing I want to comment is that if you're loading data uh, into Kuzu, you know, try to use copy from. That's the fastest way. So right now that is the limit. There is the limitation that you could only do it on an empty table. So that feature is, I think, going to be important if you're uh, doing bulk. If you if you want to have a setup where you you're doing bulk imports from time to time, which currently is not supported, you can do it once, and then you could do create statements. But our in general our updates are very naive. This transaction and copy from hopefully in a few releases, uh, they will fix that situation. So you're going to get a lot more competent on ingesting create statements as well. 
You're also going to be a lot faster when doing additional bulk imports into a non-empty table. So uh, hopefully sort of the loading times uh, and data ingestion times and write times are going to improve a lot uh, in the uh, upcoming upcoming few, uh, few um, uh, releases. Okay, you have a question. Uh, yes, uh, I, I was curious about, do you have plans for putting, uh, you know, tooling like Shackle on top of uh, the new RDF support? Because it, it, it seems like, uh, you know, if they were at least like a, a fast data rater for the RDF triples, I, I could do a pull request for Shackle in Python, you know, with <laughs> like 10 minutes of code. So Shackle to verify that, you know, uh, the, it, the, the data that you imported into Kuzu complies with some constraints, right? Yes. Yeah, so on the, on, on the one though. hand, it's it's being used for like unit test and 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 code like like data import code quality. Uh, uh, on the other hand, it's it's also being used uh, for for some forms of inference. Like for instance, uh, does the following uh, representation uh, comply with the regulations that we have. And so people will, will represent regulations in, in shackle or checks. Yeah. So, uh, let me just tell you kind of where we are in this, in this feature. So like we kind of designed this early last summer, uh, and I had put a design doc and there in that design doc, uh, inference and shackle, uh, where, uh, or RDF star, several RDF related sort of uh, features were under the advanced features. So, um, and we haven't made a call about how advanced we want to get into this without first seeing uh, how much people are using and how much people demand. But, but it is, uh, you know, possible that we can say, okay, there are there is a community of users who are using this and they want more advanced RDA features, at which point we would design and prioritize some of the advanced features. Uh, but we are at a stage where we are kind of not uh, investing into advanced features in RDF yet without first seeing some reactions. Uh, but yeah, if there is kind of, if we see enough evidence that people want something like Neo Semantics, like Neo Semantics is a lot of features, right? It's a hard, like, you know, it's also a way of mapping our triples into uh, property graph plus it comes with a lot of other kind of things you could do uh, with that RDF graph. Uh, you could do, for example, shackle constraint checking and whatnot. Um, yeah, we can do these things. So my my you know the general position of the team right now is that we can do these things. We are open to doing them, but we first want to see a little bit more about how people are going to use this and first get a bit of, first have a phase where we get a bit of feedback from 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 people as the community grows. Yeah. Okay. Great. Harish, did you have a question? Yeah, so I, I was wondering about the Postgres slash DougDB integration. Uh, when you query, would you do pushdowns? Like, you know, so if I have a predicate on the Postgres side, would you push down stuff? So my larger question is how much of my data should I copy into Kuzu? You know, if I can keep it in, in, in a data store and then, you know, do pushdowns during query time. That would be ideal. Uh, yeah, I think so. I'm. Z, I may not be the best person. Okay. Z yeah. Z might be the best person to answer this. By the way, Z is, is Z here. I mean, if he's not here, I can answer instead. I think he, we he do is, perform. He is here, but he may he might just be distracted. Uh, he's he's I on see. the Zoom call, but uh, he's he doesn't seem to be hearing us. Yeah. So uh, all right. Why don't you give your best answer? Yeah, I think based on my understanding, we do perform pushdowns when when we scan from Postgres because we are sending, we are rewriting queries and sending them to Postgres directly. So any predicate is also part of the query writing, and we are scanning the output of Postgres. So that pushdown should be <clears throat> done automatically, I believe. And in terms of how much data you want to move between Postgres and Kuzu, it depends how much data you want to put into Kuzu. Like ideally you just want to, like in the most ideal case, you don't want to scan more data from Postgres than 
than the data you want to put into Kudu. You want to scan the exact amount. So that, so as yeah, long as, yeah, yeah. so if you are able to get a, write a Postgres query that scans that amount of data, then I would say you are able to shape the exact amount. Yeah, you talked, a little, you sort of touched on this, so like uh, about uh, better representation of data, like, you know, on your site for things like strings, do you do dictionary encoding? Do you store the data in columnar form? So how, how to, uh, you know, how to think about yeah. how much uh, space would Kuzu take up for the different uh, data, you know, kinds of data that you want to put in Kuzu? Like if we put uh, uh, large strings, so are you doing dictionary encoding? Yeah, we do, we do, we do dictionary. So yeah, so we do dictionary encoding. We do bit packing on integer call integer properties. Um, yeah, we do constant compression as Xiang. I don't know if you were there. You joined a little bit late, but we do constant right. compression. So there is a set of standard compression techniques that we do, uh, and dictionary encoding is 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 one of them for strings. So there isn't an easy way for us to say like how much space your data will take, but often most of like a big chunk of the data will be um, so one thing you know you know we do have column form we do have columnar storage, and so we can we can compress the data um, and benefit from columnar storage. Um, we do have uh, this one thing, which is the double indexing of the relationship of the relationships. So if you got data sets that have a lot of uh, relationship properties, so they get double indexed to do the scans faster uh, and, and in a sequential way for each node. Mm -hmm. So that's one, one kind of place where our storage has an overhead. But other than that, you know, every every storage of every property, rel or neighborhood IDs or node properties, they're all columnar and can be compressed. Um, but again, it's, you know, it's very difficult to say like a database of this size will be that much. The best way to do this is that for us to maybe um, from time to time in our release blog posts or from time to time on some of our blogs, just show how much LDBC data sets are getting converted, which we already have. Like whenever we implemented the new compression technique, we always say, okay, the person table in the LDBC benchmark now takes this much space and things like that. To just to look at that, to get a sense of the size of the databases that you would get. Okay, yeah, <clears throat> thanks, thanks, that helps. Yeah. yeah. So Zia, now that you're online, so uh, should... yes, we can do filter push downs to Postgres scan queries. So we will be able to. That was the answer. Yeah. Right. So so that you you just do it in your query planner, right? So we just write cipher and you'll decide what to push down. Yeah. Yeah. Ah uh, yes. So you you'll be able we will to generate. Yeah. Let me answer maybe. Maybe. Uh, so if you're familiar with uh, sort of DuckDB extensions or Postgres extensions, these systems also have extension mechanisms. So you will be able to attach a different database, Postgres database, and ho hopefully over time, uh, MySQL and DuckDB and Iceberg databases as well. And then once you've attached the database, you can query tables in them, just like we have this load from statement uh, and querying pandas data frames, which is in uh, essentially this tabular format, right? So you can do load from, for example, a Postgres table, and then be able to scan it. Um, and yeah, so that's the that's the general for this first feature. That's the general way you will use it, and it will hopefully simplify migrating databases. Uh, like if you got a set of records in Postgres that you want to model as a set of nodes or relationship tables. You can do copy from this table in Postgres, and then it will do will do the scan for you and move the data. Uh, it will get more complex and more advanced, I think, and I think it will turn into a very nice feature where you can even uh, maybe we can even consider features where you will directly model those tables as node and relationship tables, and without migrating to Kuzu, we'll try to give you maybe a a. Cap 
capability to query them as node or relationship tables in Cypher. So, you know, not in the first step, but we could also do more advanced features like this. It's it's things that we're brainstorming about. Yeah, yeah, this this definitely opens up very interesting possibilities. Uh, yeah, I so got it, also, thanks, thanks. Yeah. yeah, this also fits into our general vision as like, we wanna be to go to system to model all your, all sorts of records uh, that you have, that you wanna model as a graph in the property graph world, right? Uh, if you got essentially CSV files, if you got parquet files, if you got relational databases or, you know, turtle files in RDF format and you want to model them uh, in the property graph world and get Cypher over them, we want to give this capability, make it very easy to do this. And we don't do this now, but eventually hopefully do this even off of without loading data directly into Kuzu. So have these kind of external node tables or external rel tables that you have modeled and defined, but we haven't moved the data. Whenever mm -hmm. you need them, you're gonna be able to scan them off from their sources. Um, so give them, give people cipher over basically their records that they wanna model as nodes and relationship tables, right? But not in the first version of Postgres, we're, gonna, we're not gonna do that, but we are brainstorming about uh, how to do that feature over time. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Right. Good. Yeah, I have a small question um, or unrelated. Um, so we're talking about Postgres. Um, how does Kuzu compare to um, the graph extension for Postgres, uh, Apache AG? Uh, I don't really know that extension very well, uh, frankly, to <laughs> compare it. Yeah. So what what query language do you get over it? You get Cypher. So it's a an extension to Postgres um, that uh, puts a prop graph model on top. And then I thought, oh, no, you don't get Cypher. You have to use, I think, a weird uh, SQL extension. Yeah, yeah, it's not Cypher. I've heard about this. It's not Cypher. It's, um, yeah, it's some kind of SQL dialect. So there but, is a, uh, but, so there's a SQL PGQ that, uh, that's an official SQL extension. Okay. To the property graph, maybe it's, it does that. I, mean, I don't know, so I shouldn't comment, but no. it, it seems like this the spirit of that extension and what we want to do is similar in that we want eventually not now but eventually allow you to model your tables or views in postgres as node and relationship tables so you get cipher over them uh, and not only that be able to query it directly in off of postgres instead of moving the data um right but you know uh, what is our kind of value add that we want uh, why, why would we want people to use ours instead of uh, the um, Postgres extensions? The reason we'd want people to use us is because we we have a very competent query processor for graph queries. So like our operators that consume your node tables and relation tables are highly optimized. And that's where our expertise has been in query processing uh, generally. So we get a lot of good ideas about how to do fast query processing of graphs. So um, with the kind of investment that we are doing at the core, our kind of recursive joins, shortest path algorithms, all of those are going to be those operators. So we are, are uh, becoming uh, very competent. So we hope to show people that, you know, uh, we'll be able to handle those queries much better than if you were to directly sort of compile those queries into SQL and then SQL optimizer optimizes it and uses their join and uh, other operators. So that's kind of destined to be uh, slower than our query processor. Right, so that's our bet and we wanna show this to people. Great, no, I like this answer and I'd encourage you to keep staying focused. Um, we're gonna keep asking to add, for you to add any kind of feature you could imagine, um, keep saying no as much as possible. Um, but I, I really, I think the RDF ex extension is exciting. Um, and I am curious about trying it out more. Uh, it's helpful to see 
what your tables are like. Um, I'm pretty curious about trying it out more for um, basically a prop graph that I kind of ground in the RDF world. Um, like I'd still like to leverage um, these published uh, ontologies and vocabularies, um, but I wanna live in a prop graph world where there's not a jillion nodes and computation is efficient. Um, and if I could still kind of build links back to um, the semantic meaning um, without having to just have all my graphs be huge and slow, um, that, that sounds good. Great. Yeah, so, uh, well, let's see. As I said, you know, we're happy to invest more in the RDF graphs and have a kind of advanced features so that takes the feature a bit more towards something like Neo semantics, maybe where we have these additional features that we give through function calls or maybe more natively. Uh, so we'll see though. We just wanna see first for a while, uh, have a phase where we see the reaction and, and uh, adoption. Yeah. Good, any other comments, questions? Good, thanks a lot. Congrats. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Thank a lot you, everyone, for making it. Preparing this again. And uh, yeah, well, we'll keep you posted. See you around, everyone.